Anybody here still reconcile their bank accounts? <laughs> bank statements, you get your monthly? Yes, good. I do. Some people don't. They just trust the system. I, I never got to that point. I, it's funny. I'm not a detail guy, but when it comes to reconciling a bank statement, I do it every month. It's always a chore. I'm always glad when I come right up to the end and there's my figure, there's the bank's figure, and if they're the same, my job is done and I love it. I could go watch a red box movie, but every once in a while, they're off. And I don't care if it's off a dime. I've got to find it. And I don't care if it's off in my favor. I've got to find it. And I will go back over everything, searching until I get the bank statements reconciled. You know, it's funny that I should be a pastor of a community church being so concerned with everything being reconciled. Jesus said, uh, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And I've kind of recast that statement for community churches. Wherever two or three are gathered in a community church, there are three or four opinions <laughs> about any given issue. But the beautiful thing about a community church is that we do have one thing in common. The one thing that we, we can all abide by, and that is we agree to disagree agreeably. Well, that's the ideal. We don't always reach the ideal, but it is an ideal toward which we strive. And we respect everybody's opinion. It's reflected on the cover of every bulletin and in our code of regulations as a family of faith. The members of this church shall have the undisturbed right to follow the word of God according to the dictates of their own consciences. Now, that's a, that's a remarkable statement. You will not find that everywhere. As a former president of the Ohio Council of Churches, the one table to which Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant denominations all come together at that one table, as the president of that organization, I used to sit down regularly with bishops and judicatory executives. In fact, a week from this week, I'll be doing it again uh, as, a, as a past president, and we'll have a retreat the night before, and then we'll have a gathering the next day. And it, it's a time to kind of just find out what's going on over in your shop and, and, uh, and uh, what have you learned and how are you doing things differently uh, or that we might learn from you. Um, and sometimes the conversations get a little slow and a little dragging. But I will tell you, I have seen these uh, very high-achieving bishops get absolutely awake up, get on the edge of their seats and lean in wondering how authority is represented in a community church. They, they're very interested. I mean, if you don't have a pope, if you don't have a bishop, if you don't have a denomination, if you don't have creedal formulations that are a test of membership, who's the authority that determines your stand or what you believe or what you're going to do. I'll say the authority is vested in the members of the congregation. Oh my, take my breath away. It's almost like the, I can imagine the English aristocracy when those cussedly independent colonists were wanting to declare their independence from the king. Well, well who, who, who's going to govern these people if, if not the king? You know, the whole concept of government by the people, of the people, for the people. I got those in the wrong order. But this is just foreign, was foreign to them, that understanding. And I'll tell you, these bishops just can, why that will be religious anarchy if you let the congregation uh, have the authority. And, and you know, the, and it just, it just kind of amazes them. Well, the secret of reconciliation, uh, I believe, is not all of us agreeing. And by the way, those bishops don't all agree with each other within their families of faith or amongst themselves about particular issues, but they do in reality come together at, uh, at a council like that. And in practice, they, they seek to collaborate with one another. But the secret of reconciliation is not all being the same. It's agreeing to disagree 
agreeably. Uh, it, it is recognizing that God has made us different in wonderful ways. There's a richness to that. And that uh, it's not something to be feared, but something to be embraced. Uh, God loves us with a perfect love, and he wants us to love one another. The title of our message for today is The Ministry of Reconciliation. It is not about reconciling bank statements. Uh, it is about reconciling ourselves one to the other and with God. Billy Graham is quoted at the top of our bulletin saying, the number, and I don't know when he made this quote, but it sure seems relevant for today. The number one problem in our world is alienation, rich versus poor, black versus white, labor versus management, east versus west. But Christ came to bring about reconciliation and peace. And we're going to find that he is sending us as ambassadors of that message into the world, into a world that is often quite divided. In our text, Paul begins, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Prior to his conversion, Paul regarded people from a worldly point of view, which is that he gathered people together into groupings based upon the, uh, certain differences. There were Jews, for example, and there were Gentiles, non-Jews. There were males and there were females. There were slaves and they, there were free. And we do the same thing in our own world. We characterize people and put them into categories based upon the color of their skin or the shape of their eyes or the sound of their accent or the flag that they fly um, or the, 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 the uh, lifestyle that they can afford. Uh, and, and all sorts of different ways we gather people, group them together in, in, in a worldly way. We regard people from a worldly point of view. Now, in Paul's case, he regarded the Jews as the chosen people of God. Well, how convenient Paul was a Jew. Well, that's what we do, right? We're, our faith is the one true expression, and all the others are somehow substandard. Well, Jews were the chosen people. Gentiles were heathens, apostates sometimes, infidels other times. Um, so women were definitely uh, to be in submission to men, big time. And he made a little progress on that over his life. He didn't quite get over it completely, but he did improve. Uh, slaves were uh, s substandard human beings. They were second-class citizens at best, third, fourth class, most likely. And this is how Paul regarded Jesus. Jesus uh, was an apostate. He was a traitor to his faith, uh, he, and he was a loser. Okay, he was convicted of a capital offense, and he was uh, sentenced, and the sentence was carried out. He was crucified. He was gone. He was a loser. Paul continues in our text, Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Uh, Paul encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, and he, he was literally, literally blinded, by his glory. He clearly been wrong about Christ and now he, he had to admit he may have been wrong about Christians as well. The persecutor became the persecuted. He became a Christian and he went around now instead of tearing down the body of Christ and throwing believers into prison and confiscating the prop property, he now gathered them into churches wherever he could go. And he no longer cared if somebody was circumcised Hebrew or uncircumcised Gentile or if someone was male or female. In fact, many of the people who coalesced churches where he went were, were women of faith. And uh, he wrote to them and about them. And he didn't care if somebody was slave or free. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, he wrote, To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those not having the law, I became like those not having the law. To win those not having the law. To the weak, I became like the weak. To win the weak. I have done this, I've become all things to all men and women so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. 
You see, because God could forgive Paul, Paul regarded himself as the worst of sinners. It didn't get any worse than that. You, persecuting God himself, uh, is, uh, ascending to the death of, of Stephen and, and other believers and, and has, harassing them. It doesn't get any worse than this. I'm the worst of sinners. But in me, the worst of sinners, God showed his unlimited patience. God reconciled himself with Paul. And Paul says, if he can do that with the worst of sinners, then he can do that with you, with anybody. And if God has become reconciled with his other children, whom he loves with a perfect love, then ought not we be reconciled with one another? Paul continues, all this is from God who reconciled reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Not just to me, Paul, but to us. The ministry, the message of reconciliation. And if it was uh, relevant for Paul in his day, it is surely relevant for us in our own day. We are all called, he says, to be ambassadors, not just Paul, to be ambassadors of the ministry and the message of reconciliation. How's that working for you, by the way? Any, any old friends with whom you have crafted precious memories from whom you are now estranged? Primary relationships, brothers and sisters, maybe a difference of an opinion about what's in mom's best interest in the nursing home or or who gets the crystal, or, you know, uh, any, any, estra- if no estrangement like that's going on in your life, God bless you, you're part of the blessed minority. Because for most of us, there's someone with whom we have become estranged. What is the message of reconciliation calling us to do? What is the ministry of reconciliation calling us to do? under these circumstances? It's an important question because it was important to Jesus. Just a moment ago we heard an offertory sentence where Jesus said, if you're bringing your offering, you know, you want to get chummy with me, you want to be, (laughs) you know, close with me, but your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your altar first, or your offering, go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, then come. And be chummy, because you're not going to be close with me and reconciled with me so long as you are estranged from that person. Well, what could that person have against us? What does he mean by that if, if your brother or sister has something against you? Well, maybe it was their fault that we have this estrangement. After all, they're the ones with the issues. They were the unreasonable ones. They sinned against us, and anybody could, could determine that and see that. They've got this coming. They created this on their own. You know, the same could kind of be said about us, though, in our relationship with God, right? We rejected the Almighty. We, we've got issues. We've sinned against God. And yet God has searched us out and reached us through Christ to seek reconciliation. We don't deserve it. But he did that. That's the kind of God we worship. If we've been on the receiving end of that kind of charity, don't you suppose we ought to be willing to extend it to others? Maybe what we, they have against us is that we haven't done what is within our power to seek. We haven't reached out to them, at least tried with them. Maybe that's what they have against us. Now, you... you, you You can't do that uh, on your own. I mean, reconciliation, it takes two to to tango here. It takes two to to come back together. You can't force other people. But Paul wrote once, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It may not be possible. It may not depend upon you, but you won't know unless you take the initiative. Now, if somebody rebuffs you, okay, you tried, the ball's in their court. Uh, 
you can't do it on your own, but you won't know. Have you done what you can to seek reconciliation? And if not, they have something against you. And I think you're going to be surprised that much more often than not, that person has been just as bothered as you have been by the estrangement between you. That they are just as desirous of reconciliation as you are. That they appreciate that you have reached out to them and all the more as the advancing years take their toll. Because I think there's something instinctively wrong about standing before the, the Lord at the last hour and, and seeking some justification for heaven and leaving that kind of unfinished business behind. May God find us a people prepared at the last hour for the place he has prepared for us. And may Easter find us a people prepared for his resurrecting, reconciling, restoring power. And may today find us a people prepared for the ministry and the message of reconciliation in a world that, and a nation that desperately is polarized and needs to hear it. Please rise.